As I mentioned earlier, the incredible work of Tzedek Association is the vision of Rabbi Moshe Margaretin. And he was extremely pleasantly surprised when on Friday, his daughter handed him the phone and said, it's some senator. And it was, of course, Senator Blumenthal indicating that he would be the surprise guest here today. And for that, we are very grateful. Senator Blumenthal, as Senator Booker said, is truly a hero. He's standing up on Mount Rushmore, in effect. He's the guy that people turn to, to listen to on those Sunday morning talk shows, which I don't think anybody here watches, but you probably see little snippets of it on WhatsApp. So whatever the issue is, from domestic to foreign, from criminal justice reform to health reform, Senator Blumenthal is the guy that everyone turns to. And fortunately, he is the person that SEDEC is now turning to as well for help. So as I mentioned earlier, I was given a, uh, a brief bio to introduce Senator Blumenthal in addition to acknowledging his status as a hero and, and the person everybody turns to. He is also somebody who supported the First Step Act, courageously crossing party lines with the White House that some people in the Democratic Party said, no, don't support them, don't help them. But he, like Senator Booker, understood that this was a matter of improving lives, of saving lives and bringing families back together. And he was able to do this, taking a lead on the Judiciary Committee and playing an extremely important role and continues to do so on the Judiciary Committee to make sure that America does have important criminal justice reforms that SEDEC Association works so hard for. We also recognize your incredible friendship with the Jewish community in Connecticut, but all over the country, as witnessed by the many organizations in the Jewish community, from the American Jewish Committee to the ADL, the Conference of Presidents, and, and down the line, who all have recognized your incredible work. We also remember with special gratitude your advocating for the justice in the case of Shalom Rabashkin and how, how you advocated on his behalf. Today, we're not only here just to honor you, Senator Blumenthal, but also to express continued gratitude for your incredible dedication. And in the Jewish community, there's a saying, Kol Yisrael Arevim Zebazeh, each and every one of us has a deep and abiding responsibility for one another. Here at Sedek, that responsibility transcends the Jewish community. Everyone here works to improve the lives of everyone in America everyone throughout the world, whether it's here, whether it's in Ukraine. Um, as I understand, you were on the phone with Rabbi Margaretin when he visited Ukraine to meet with President Zelensky. That is pure heroism that comes together from the heroism from these two senators and the heroism of Tzedek Association. And ladies and gentlemen, although the ladies I believe are next door, I give you Senator Richard Blumenthal and we wish you were a full shalema. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, just in case you're wondering, I had surgery for a broken leg about five weeks ago, so uh, I am still using a cane. I was in a victory parade. Some of you may remember the Yukon Huskies, the basketball team won the national championship. The parade was in Hartford and someone walking backwards hit me from behind. Someone about the size of Cory Booker hit me from behind. It was not Cory Booker. He is a football hero, but he never clipped anyone. And uh, so I had surgery about five weeks ago, and I will tell you, not even a broken leg could keep me away from you today. Thank you. I, I want to thank uh, Rabbi Margaretin uh, and all of the leaders of this great organization for your leadership. Your leadership, your voices and faces on behalf of a cause that is truly humanitarian. It is a civil rights cause. Insurance coverage 
for people who need it is a civil rights cause because there should be no discrimination against people who have that inability and who can be helped. Why should there be a denial of medical care for people who need that essential life-giving capacity? I want to thank my, my great colleague and friend, Cory Booker. I was glad there was a speaker before me because I never want to follow him. He is better looking, smarter, nicer, he's younger, and he is a great leader. And I mean very seriously, a great leader. And if you want to invest in the future, Cory Booker is your man because he will be a leader, not just now, but in the future as well. And I am very grateful. I am very grateful to him for coming from New Jersey. You know, he didn't need a passport to get here, but it is still a long journey for him on a Sunday afternoon. It shows you how committed he is to this cause. Now, I want to speak a little bit in personal terms. And begin with my story. My father came to this country in 1935. He came here to escape persecution in Germany. He came alone. He was 17 years old. He was younger than most of you. He came alone and he spoke no English. He had virtually nothing more than the shirt on his back he knew no one. This country gave him a chance to succeed. And he instilled in us, my brother and me, the sense that we have an obligation to give back. It's in our tradition, it's in our faith, it's who we are. I'm also a parent. I have four children. When I was married, of course, what was in my heart was my wife and I, my wife now of 40 plus years, would have children. And we did, four children. And now my children, two of them are married, have not yet had children. Having children is a joy, but it's also a part of who we are. It is a way that we give back. It's a way that we give of ourselves. Being a parent, as you know, is not easy, and it's not something that ends at a particular age. We all think, oh well, our children are now in high school, nothing more. Our children are now in college, nothing more. Our children are now out of school, nothing more. Our children are now married, nothing more. My worry, one of my main worries for my children is, can they have children? It is literally something that my wife and I discuss. And so, this cause is something that is in my heart. And I will be very honest with you, if this kind of medical treatment were needed for my children, I would go to my last dime. Literally. I would borrow if I needed to. I would do whatever it took. But some people can't. Some people can't afford it. Some people are unable to do it. This is a cause that every American should understand. It goes beyond just one religion, one race, one national background. I'm not here to preach because I recognize, as they say, you're the choir. You already have this belief. But 
I want to thank every one of you for reaching out to others who may not share this belief. Cory Booker, Senator Marshall are the leaders in this effort in the United States Senate. But every American has to be engaged because they need that support and that help. That's why I am working hard to support them because it is something that I feel in the depths of my heart, in the depths of my soul. And when I pray for my children to have children, I feel that I am praying for something bigger than myself. And you are working for something bigger than yourselves. So thank you. And let's just be very clear, this, this issue of insurance coverage, you know, uh, before I became a United States Senator 12 years ago, I was Attorney General of the state of Connecticut. And I took action against insurance companies for denying care to people who needed it. People who suffered from cancer, people who suffered from diabetes, one of the things that the Affordable Care Act did was it imposed certain rules on those insurance companies. But they will deny coverage if they can find a way to do it in many instances. They're not all bad, they're not all evil, but we need that oversight and scrutiny. They need to be given a reason to do the right thing. You are giving them a reason to do the right thing. And that is God's work. Now, uh, I want to give you another thank you. I did talk to Rabbi Margaretten as he was about to meet with President Zelensky. I've met with President Zelensky now about five times, three of them in Kyiv. I've been to Ukraine three times over roughly the last year. I don't know whether you know how you get to Kyiv. You fly into Poland, you take another flight from Warsaw to Seychelles, which is on the border, and you take an overnight train, literally about 12 hours on train. You can't fly these days. And then when you arrive, you go to, it's a fortified building, a bunker, to meet with President Zelensky. He is a magnetic, a charismatic person. You know, when he was offered, I'm sure you remember this, the chance to leave Ukraine. The Russians were going to take it over. They were going to not only take over the country, but seize Kyiv and him. And America offered him a plane to leave. And he said, don't give me a plane. Give me more ammunition. That is the spirit of the Ukrainian people. They are willing to die for their democracy, their freedom, their sovereignty. And they are doing it right now. In Bakhmud, along the eastern border, Donetsk, and in the south, Kharkiv, all throughout the front where they are confronting the Russians. I have been an active advocate of more aid for Ukraine and you are, again, providing Ukraine with what it needs. The ambulances that this organization, more than 30 ambulances, are vital to saving lives, soldiers' lives, civilians' lives. The Russians have bombed Ukraine in the same way that the Nazis bombed Britain at the beginning of the war. And the Ukrainians are reacting the same way. If you're in Kyiv right now, Kyiv was bombed just last night, the Ukrainians are going to work, they're going to school. When they hear the air raid sirens, they go to the bunkers. And when the sirens end, they come back to go to school, to go to work. That's their heroism. I am inspired by the people of Ukraine, but also by the world's reaction, your reaction, 
to give them that aid that they need, the humanitarian assistance that is so essential. And I'll just tell you one last story that I think you and I can understand maybe better than other people. The second time that I went to Ukraine, I visited Bucha, which is a town right outside Kyiv. I visited Bucha and a number of other towns that the Russians reached when they invaded. It's about a 15, 20 minute drive from Kyiv. That's how close they came. And I went to the mass graves. The mass grave sites where the Russians tied the hands of women and children behind their backs and then shot them in the head. They buried them in those mass graves. Not just a few, not just 10 or so, hundreds. This is what we saw during the Holocaust. Killing people simply because they were Jewish, killing people simply because they were Ukrainians. And that is why there's an arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin. He is wanted as a war criminal by the International Court of Criminal Justice. That is why the President of the United States has said he has committed crimes against humanity. When you aid Ukraine, you are standing up for humanity, you're standing up for the rule of law, you're standing up for democracy and religious freedom, and for all the values that we prize so highly. Because we know, we know how precious these freedoms are. So let me just close by again thanking all of your leaders for coming here today, for your continuing your aid to Ukraine, for your fighting for this cause that will help so many people, and for your continuing to educate the American people about why this legislation is so important to all of us, to all of us. And I look forward to being with you again, and thank you for having my great friend Cory Booker here. I always am grateful for an opportunity to be with him because he is a man of such great humanity and good humor. And you are wonderful to have him here. And thank you uh, to the rabbis, to the religious leaders, and all of you. Thank you.